we'll go ahead and start it with the neoplastic and infectious disorders. And I guess this is a nice lead in given the couple of in infection cases that we discussed earlier. Um, the first presentation will be on metastatic disease. And uh, the question is, is, is there something new? Has there been a change in the treatment options or the preferred treatment methods for metastatic lesions of the spine? And Dr. Shaffrey will present this. Jens asked me to discuss whether there is anything new or different the way, for the way the majority of, us, majority of us are treating metastatic disease. And, I, and looking over the literature and looking over practice patterns, I think that there are two different issues. I think is the, issue, the, the first issue is what we're doing. And I don't think that there's been a radical change in the last three to five years as we as spine surgeons, how we've been treating metastatic disease. I think that what may be occurring, though, is the perception of our referring colleagues, the oncologists, the radiation therapy people, who have had traditionally a fairly nihilistic opinion as far as what the results of surgical management for metastatic uh, spine disease is. And part of the problem is there are a number of historical studies that have demonstrated what was felt to be equivalency between radiation therapy and, uh, and steroids and a laminectomy for surgical treatment. And all these uh, studies that were done during the 70s and the early 80s compared these two issues. And what was, what was shown was that they were equivalent. And the reality is, is that if you, in the oncologist's mind, if you can go and send someone to radiation therapy or put them through a big open procedure, why not send them to radiation therapy? And what their tradition has been is that the patients who undergo a laminectomy at three months, only about 30% of those patients have maintained the ability to ambulate who had some evidence of spinal cord compression. Because of this, the thought process was that this was not a particularly successful procedure. And uh, this was actually a, a recent study uh, that was reported in JBGS. And th in this study, they talked about doing a laminectomy plus instrumentation as the procedure of choice for metastatic spine disease. This is a patient who had multiple myeloma involving the, a little bit of the pedicle in the vertebral body. And this is the construct that was done for this, uh, for, uh, for this procedure. And even in this study itself, it shows that this went on to collapse and ended up developing a significant myel uh, myelographic block and ended up having to have a, a second, stage, uh, second stage procedure uh, performed. So, is there a treatment paradigm? Well, one thing I think that has changed in the last 10 years is that there's been a realization that what needs to be dealt with is where the pathology is. And the reality, in patients with a neurological deficit who have spinal cord compression, about 70% of the patients have predominantly anterior compression. About 20% of patients have predominantly lateral compression, and only about 10% of patients have predominantly posterior compression. And I think Harrington had a relatively landmark study that was presented in the late 80s that showed that he had substantially improved neurological function, including the ability to maintain the ability to ambulate by, uh, by doing an anterior decompression and stabilization. And this is, this is one of my patients that I operated on a couple weeks ago who had this significant involvement of the thoracic spine who we did an anterior decompression and a posterior instrument, in, instrumentation. This patient who had a substantial neurological deficits has made already a complete recovery uh, from, from that perspective. Well, the second thing is I think there's an increasing realization that maybe we should be performing surgery a bit earlier. What we don't want to have is patients who come in who are paraplegic. We want to get patients while they're still, uh, we can maintain the ability to ambulate. And one of the more important things is recognition of those patients who are having pending pathological fractures. And some of the risk factors for this are cost of vertebral joint destruction and a percentage of the vertebral body involvement. And in the thoracic spine, if you have just the vertebral body itself involved between 50 and 60 percent, uh, there is a high risk of this person going on to have a pathological fracture. If you have involvement of the costal vertebral joint as well, then only 25 or 30 percent of the vertebral body needs to be involved to be at risk for having a fracture. In the lumbar spine, the risk factors are pedicle destruction and a percentage of body involvement. And again, in the lumbar spine, between 35 and 40 percent of the vertebral body involvement alone is at significant risk for pathological fracture, and it's only 25 percent if you have the pedicle involved alone. 
So it's my feeling that we as spine surgeons can do a better job by recognizing this degree of involvement. And if this is present, we should be operating on these, uh, on these, on these patients. And this, this, is the, uh, this is the different, uh, different patients were enrolled in this, uh, in this study that, uh, that, that gave, the, uh, gave that rationale. Well, do we have to do every one of them purely from an anterior approach? Does every patient need to have a thoracotomy who has anterior involvement? Well, there have been several studies that showed either a costotransversectomy transversectomy or a radical pediculectomy and decompression can be quite successful. And this was a, a recent publication in Spine that showed that they did uh, quite a good job as far as pain relief and improvement of neurological function by taking that type of approach for patients with metastatic spine disease. Um, this is again, this is a, this is a patient of uh, mine who I operated on again in the last uh, several months. This is a patient who had significant involvement of T1 and T2 with uh, almost complete uh, destruction of the T2 vertebral body, a pathologic fracture of T1 and significant uh, cord compression who because of the location in the, uh, the, my desire to obviate doing a sternectomy in this renal cell carcinoma, I approached him from a, uh, from a, from a posterior lateral approach and did, uh, and did, this, uh, did this reconstruction on the, uh, on the patient. Finally, what, what type of complications are we going to expect by aggressively treating uh, metastatic spine disease? And what things are uh, risk factors for that? Well, a recent study by Wise went and, uh, went and uh, operated on patient with, peop with progressive neurological deficit uh, without uh, deficits were progressing with lack of response to radiation, intractable pain, radioresistant tumors are for histologic diagnosis. And in this group of patients, by aggressively treating them, uh, uh, the average survival was almost 16 months. There was about 25% uh, uh, complication rate. And what they found was is that the patients who had lower Frankel grades, the people who had significant neurological deficits, were at higher risk of having a major complication. Similarly, uh, patients who had uh, Harrington classifications with neurological deficits were also at higher risk as far as, as, far as having complications. Patients who had received preoperative radiation treatment increased the likelihood of having operative complications, uh, and there was no significant difference related to the type of uh, tumor. And this is the uh, Harrington classification. And basically, patients with vertebral body collapse with uh, significant neurologic compromise were at the group who had the highest uh, rate of complications in this series. Well, finally, should we be, at least at the University of Washington, we are frequently treated as the salvage surgeon. That what's happened is a patient's been seen for a metastatic spine lesion, they've received radiation therapy, chemotherapy, they're immunocompromised, they have wound problems to begin with, and then they're saying, okay, we'd like for you to operate. And then the oncologists say, that when, at least when I speak with them, they say, well, look at, you know, your complication rate is 20% in the patients we send to you. And I say, well, you send us me the final end stage result. Maybe what we should be doing is more aggressively treating the patients who have the criteria I mentioned before, before the radiation uh, had occurred. And this is a series that looked at that. And what they found that patients with radiation before surgery had a major wound complication rate of 32% versus 12% where aggressive de novo surgery was performed before the radiation therapy was performed. 75% of the patients who were ambulatory, uh, were, were ambulatory with de novo surgery remained ambulatory and continent 30 days later, whereas only 50% of those patients who had radiation therapy before their surgery were able to, uh, were able to do so. So, uh, so what I feel is that the uh, current rational treatment uh, paradigm is that, is that, uh, that either a, that an anterior and posterior reconstruction needs to be performed, that anterior decompression or reconstruction can be done either transpedicularly by a cost of transversectomy or by an anterior approach depending on upon uh, what the circumstances are. And some of these things are going to be discussed in a few minutes. Uh, I think that most, uh, almost all cases require spinal instrumentation. Uh, that we should perform surgery whenever possible before radiation therapy has been performed, that we should operate while they're still neurologically intact or have only minor neurological deficits, and we should operate before a, a major pathological fracture occurs. Um, and most, pa most patients do not require a fusion. I, my personal feeling is, is if the life expectancy is under two years, a, 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 a solid, rigid construct of instrumentation alone uh, without, uh, without fusion reduces the uh, risks associated with surgery, reduces the morbidity of the procedure, and gives good, uh, good results for the time period the patients are alive. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.
The next presentation, Dr. West is going to compare thoracotomy to costotransversectomy. With regard to comparison of thoracotomy anterior approaches or combined approaches versus costotransversectomy, uh, <clears throat> basically uh, in looking at this from a thoracotomy anterior approach, some of the uh, concerns have been that, uh, that and considered significant were uh, persistent pleural effusions hemothorax, chylothorax, uh, fistulas, and uh, high mortalities uh, in the range from as low as 3 to 30 percent. With guard, regard to costro, costotransversectomy, which has really uh, uh, begun in the mid-70s and uh, increased uh, more in popularity, uh, initially a lot of the reports uh, suggest that they were very low, much lower rates of complications in the range from uh, 11 to 16 percent and the advantage that it allows both uh, approach to the anterior and uh, posterior. In looking at this, uh, this study was looked at here at the University of Washington comparing uh, perioperative complications, uh, again in all these patients, uh, many of which were, did receive some uh, additional surgeries. We looked at uh, only the initial surgery. Uh, there were 29 patients in the costo uh, transversectomy group and 18 in the uh, thoracotomy, thoracolumbar, and combined. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, sort of uh, baseline characteristics. Uh, importantly, majority of these again were metastatic disease. Um, in the costo transversectomy group, they tended to involve much uh, a greater number of levels. Uh, most of which were centered in the uh, upper thoracic spine uh, exclusively. Uh, the other thing was in these, uh, importantly in these cost of transversectory uh, group was that they actually had much higher uh, comorbidities. So uh, in that uh, range that was uh, fairly significant. With regard to the surgery, uh, the, the uh, group in the cost of transversectomy had a much uh, greater number of levels that uh, were stabilized. Uh, again, in comparison to thoracotomy, which again, the, uh, they had a fewer number of levels involved in the disease. Uh, there was a statistically important distinction between the uh, number of chest tubes and neurologically. Uh, there was only one death uh, in this group, and that was uh, in the uh, costotransferectomy group. With regard to uh, the uh, levels involved, again, uh, this is the, in dark bars here, the, the levels over which uh, uh, spine involvement and the costo transversectomy group. Very few uh, had an anterior lone approach thoracotomy, and uh, in the lower thoracic level, uh, they were nearly even in terms of the number of approaches. Again, the summary of the complications as you can see here, there was one death in the uh, costo transversectomy. In terms of wound uh, complications, they were much higher in the costo transversectomy, in large part, the uh, length of wound. Otherwise, most of these complications were very similar. Uh, in terms of the severity of uh, complications, this was looked at, and as you can see here, comparison these two take, uh, techniques, the severity of the uh, complications is essentially the same. The number of complications per patient, uh, there was no statistical uh, difference. And looking at the quality of uh, care, uh, in uh, comparison to these two uh, uh, techniques, there was no significant uh, difference. Uh, again, this is just showing uh, two uh, cases here. This is a woman that was uh, 85 years old with known uh, metastatic uh, breast cancer. She had had radiation two years ago. She presented in about a 24-hour period of acute uh, paraplegia, and uh, she had this uh, a long history of uh, back pain, but it was attributed to this very large pleural effusion, and uh, she really had not uh, obtained any imaging, uh, unfortunately, but when she presented, she was basically complete, and she had a, a limited procedure. She was not at all interested, nor her family. Actually, they were very reluctant to surgery at all, and this was a very straightforward, uh, simple approach, old-fashioned, with just a 